In the previous video, we have seen how plane waves are reflected by surfaces, um, rigid surfaces, zero pressure surfaces, or surfaces carrying an impedance boundary conditions. But plane waves do not always impinge on a surface with a normal incidence. They usually come up with a non uh, normal incidence and we have to see at how then the reflection takes place. And in fact we're going to look at a very important and very general law of wave physics which has been initially discovered by uh, the French philosopher uh, Descartes. It's called Le Descartes' law of specular reflection. And it just basically says that if you have a wave um, impinging an incident wave impinging on a surface with a certain angle of incidence theta, well, the reflected wave will uh, have the same incidence. It will just be, uh, its direction is going to change, but the angle theta of both the incident wave and the reflected wave are equal. If you look at that in terms of a wave vector, the incident wave vector has uh, kx and ky uh, component, uh, we, we look at the 2D situation, and what Descartes says is that the reflected wave will have the same components, but just the x component will have a change of sign, so that the angle theta of the two vectors is identical. Remember that the, the uh, component of the wave vector, kx and ky, are related to the wave number k, which is defined as omega divided by c. We have the very important relationship that kx squared plus ky squared is equal to k squared, which is omega divided by c uh, squared. So let's try to look at uh, the Descartes law from a non-mathematical point of view. <coughs> So let's take a first look. Uh, we have an incident wave uh, with components of the wave vector kx and ky. Uh, mathematically, this field is described as the product of two simple plane waves, one that propagates along the x-axis and one that propagates along the y-axis. The one along the x-axis as a wave number kx, the one along the y-axis as a wave number ky. And we can look at these in terms of reflection separately. If I first take a look at the component that is uh, aligned with the y-axis, it propagates parallel to the plane, and so in fact it never meets the plane, it does not impinge on the plane, and so it's not reflected, and there is no reason for that plane wave to change anything. So there is necessarily a continuity of the Y component, and the reflected wave will have the same Y component. For the blue part of the wave, well, we've seen that just before. We know that a plane wave that hits a wall with a normal incidence is going to be reflected and so its wave vector is just uh, reflected as well and changes and the wave changes direction in the x direction. So that we have again a vector with two components but now it is no longer kx ky but minus kx and ky and you see that the um, uh, Descartes law uh, applies. Again, we start from an incident wave that, that uh, travels towards the plane with a certain incidence angle uh, theta. But in fact, uh, this gives us the propagation direction. Uh, the wave fronts are perpendicular to the wave direction. And so if we look at the pressure distribution, or in this case the velocity uh, distribution along the propagation direction, we have here uh, a, 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 a sine uh, wave, uh, a sine distribution of the velocities, and it goes to zero at the wave fronts, and we are showing here two wave fronts. But from the point of view of the plane, of the surface that is experiencing uh, the pressure from, from the wave, 
uh, things are slightly different, we have to look at the trace of the pressure or the trace of the velocity along that plane. And you see that it is really stretched because the apparent wavelength on the wall is no longer lambda, but lambda divided by sine theta that I call lambda prime. And if I now consider a reflected wave, um, I see that it will have also a certain trace and I want these two traces of velocities, these two velocity distribution on the wall to cancel each other. And you see that if you want the cancellation to occur everywhere, the angle theta must be identical because the apparent wavelength of the velocity trace on the wall must be uh, identical. So lambda is of course identical uh, because the two waves are propagating in the same uh, medium, medium and therefore the sine theta must be um, equal. But you also see that for the waves to exactly cancel one another, uh, the, the wave number in the y direction must be identical for the two waves and they must have the same value but a different sign along the x direction so that the two velocity traces on the wall have uh, 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 um, uh, are defaced by 180 degrees. Um, there is a third way to look at Descartes' law and it is in terms of image sources. Um, in the previous videos we've seen that an incident wave uh, impinging the surface with a um, uh, normal incidence is just perfectly reflected in the other direction. There is an alternative way to look at that perfect reflection is to say that in fact the real source, the incident wave, travels towards the wall then is totally absorbed by the wall, gets into the wall and disappears and there's another wave traveling in the other direction that comes out of the wave to create the uh, reflected wave. It's maybe easier to see here. You have the wall that is materialized by, by the dashed line. On the left hand side you have the real physical space. On the right hand side you have a virtual space which is a space that extends beyond the wall. You see that the wave, uh, the incident wave travels towards the wall and then tra goes through the wall and keeps on propagation, propagating in the virtual space. But at the same time you have a wave that is exactly the symmetrical of the incident wave that exists on the other side of the wall that travels towards the wall and exactly when the incident wave gets into the wall the other one gets out of the wall and is responsible for the reflection. We've also seen the case of a perfectly soft surface. Uh, this can also be understood as the interaction between one wave that propagates towards the wall and then gets into the wall and a symmetrical or actually an anti-symmetrical uh, virtual source that exists be behind, beyond the wall travels towards the wall and becomes physical exactly at the same time as the incident wave becomes uh, virtual and the two interact together to create a zero pressure boundary condition at uh, the wall. And finally the Descartes law can be analyzed exactly in the same way. You have the incident wave and the reflected wave and you can see that as a real source that travels towards the wall and disappears and a virtual source behind, beyond the wall that progressively becomes uh, real. So the important point here, because we're going to use that again, is that from the point of view of acoustics, a rigid surface really behaves like a mirror. It, it, everything happens as if while I'm speaking here, there was another myself behind the wall uh, uh, talking uh, at the same time. Um, one last point, um, we have uh, in the, the previous video we have obtained an expression that relates the impedance 
at the wall with the reflection coefficient. Well, this, re and this relationship can be inverted to create a relationship between the reflection, expressing the reflection factor as a function of the impedance. In the case of an oblique incidence, this relationship is changing and we now have, it's very similar to the one we had for normal incidence, but uh, we now have a cosine theta terms that comes in. It is very important to understand that the only thing that makes sense from an acoustical point of view at a wall is the normal impedance. The material that you are going to place on the wall is going to force the sound field to adopt a certain pressure to normal velocity relationship. So the uh, impedance is not really a function of the incidence angle, it is a normal impedance. So it is the reflection factor that will depend on cosine theta. So the impedance is always a normal impedance and the reflection factor will react differently, well the, the reflected wave and the incident wave will react differently with the material depending on its uh, incidence angle. The truly last point uh, that I want to make in this video is to introduce the concept of specular and of diffuse reflection. Um, if you have a sound wave, here the picture is about light waves, but it's the same, um, an incident uh, wave impinging the surface with a certain angle of incidence is going to be reflected according to Descartes' law. And this is called specular reflection. It comes from the Latin speculum, which means mirror. So we have a perfect reflection in a single direction. But in practice, we always have irregularities on the surface so that if most of the energy is reflected according to Descartes' law, there is also a certain amount of energy that is redistributed in a number of directions and that is called diffuse reflection. Diffuse reflection is usually not important at low frequency but becomes more and more important as the frequency goes up. Because when frequency increases, the wavelength decreases and diffuse reflection starts to occur when the wavelength has about the same size as the irregularities on the surface. Diffuse reflection is not an issue, it's an issue in terms of analytical model, but physically it's something that we are actually looking for, especially in uh, room acoustics and concert hall acoustics. And here you have an example of a few diffusers that are placed on the wall to enhance and make sure that uh, the sound waves are and the sound energy is distributed as widely as possible across the room.